Okay, let's start uh, with a bit of a definition of what we're going to talk about today. And basic definition with various uh, nuances is breaking a rule to gain an advantage. That's the definition of cheating. There are very different forms of cheating, and one of the things I'd like to focus us on is that cheating can be accomplished on different scales. Uh, so I'll give you some examples, but I'd like to think my chip example is small scale, and maybe some of the examples I'll show you in a second is a large scale. Now, I'm sure most of you came to this talk for the last topic. Uh, we will touch on that, I promise you, but it's not the major focus. I do think that some of the principles that we're going to talk about apply to uh, sexual cheating or unfaithfulness as well. So, um, I think we can agree that cheating is ubiquitous. There is a lot of um, evidence for this. Uh, experimentally, three-fourths of 1,800 students at a number of major universities admitted to cheating, and I'm guessing that the number is actually higher. I think we all go back to our high school careers or even earlier and know that cheating was prevalent. And, and by the way, uh, there was a cheating scandal at Stuyvesant High School when I, when I was in high school. I didn't go to Stuyvesant High School. Uh, and I spoke to some people who were there at the time and said that if you weren't involved in the scandal, you were a nerd. There was actually a, a uh, elevated status that came to being part of the cheating, which is another point that I'm going to introduce along the line. Particularly of concern to me because I come from a scientific background, one third of scientists admitted to engaging in questionable research practices basically uh, fudging data. Now the prevalence is very high, the incidence is, all, is high as well. Uh, it's thought that people are lied to somewhere between 10 and 200 times a day. So examine that in your experience. When two strangers meet, there is an average of 10 lies transferred between them in the first three minutes. And there's an estimate that one in 10 interactions with your spouse is deceitful. Honey, you look great in that dress. Doesn't make you look fat, is the, the typical paradigm. So there are white lies, little lies, big lies. We're going to try to encompass some of those today. <coughs> So the point, similar to the Stuyvesant example, is cheating is thrilling for a lot of people, and actually for most of us. There's an article, this is from the New York Times this fall, Cheating Surprising Thrill, that uh, people put in an experimental uh, situation that allowed them to cheat or promoted their cheating and asked them how they felt about it they didn't feel shame or humiliation. They felt excited by it. And as long as people can think, and this is another point I'd like to introduce, that no one was harmed by the cheating, it's especially exciting. So there is a tension, and I'm going to emphasize this over and over again, between the excitement, the tendency, the wish, all the good parts about cheating, and the fact that we are a moral group in some way, so that there are restraints on cheating. And it's this tension that we're going to talk about. And indeed, um, just for today, we, we always ask, what's leadership, what's leadership? I'd like to offer, at least for our attention today, is leadership is the ability to manage <coughs> cheating. That's not all of it, but I think it's an important component, and that's part of the consciousness that I'd like to raise. So I thought I'd get our juices flowing a little bit um, by uh, the movies, and I think the movie industry would certainly go out of business if it were not for cheating. How many people have seen American Hustle? 
What's the movie about? It's cheating. And it's exciting cheating. It's about sexual cheating, about political cheating, and it's actually involved on how, in order to track cheaters, you basically have to uh, cheat as well. So the point I'd like to take in, again, cheating is an exciting activity. It involves an interaction between people. Uh, it can be thrilling. And that although we all look down on cheating and are wary of it, we actually not just condone it, but promote it. Anybody know who this fellow is? He's not in the public health service, it's okay. Uh, this is Timothy Gardena. He's an admiral. He, he uh, works in uh, intelligence. <coughs> and he lost his job because he was uh, using counterfeit chips in an Iowa, cas uh, Iowa casino. Cheating is not limited to people who are desperate, people who have advantage, people who go to Harvard uh, also cheat. These were two basketball players that were caught in a cheating scandal at Harvard, Harvard um, in, um, in 2012. And indeed, as I'll show you, there is some evidence that actually creative people cheat more. That to the degree to which you can be creative, uh, you, you might be more likely to cheat. Uh, this is a poster boy for athletic cheating. We could put uh, Mike Tomlin in there, Alex Rodriguez, all the steroid folk. I, I use this slide in my talk about stupidity, and I don't have time to develop that idea, but I think that there is some cross-fertilization between our understanding of stupidity and our understanding of cheating. And the point of that is that cheating is going on down here, not just up here. It involves emotional um, uh, experiences as much as it involves cognitive experiences. And that, that's a point I'd like to make. Financial cheating is rife. Um, Corruption is rife. It's a way of life, not just in the United States, all over the world. Uh, look at the mayors of Washington historically, the current mayor of Washington, mayor of Toronto, the <laughs> civic leaders in a number of uh, cities in California. It really is a key fabric in our society. And again, one of the, one of the hard parts about this talk is not just going and giving example after example after example and gilding the little bit, the lily a bit, although it's kind of easy to look outside and see all these cheaters. On Wednesday, there was an item in the New York Times about policemen and fire, firefighters who were on disability, who were coached by a former official uh, in an agency that, that administered funds on how to portray themselves as mentally ill. And they received something like $500 million, a billion dollars collectively, a thousand people involved. And the way they were caught, by the way, is they said they couldn't go out of the house and there were Facebook pictures of them on jet skis and helicopters and resorts all over the place. So again, it's kind of easy to say, ah, oh, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. But I, I really want to take us past that a little bit. Uh, one last example to bring the cheating down a little bit. Anybody know this person? Her name is Aphonia Green. She embezzled $5.1 million as an administrator, basically, for the American Association of Medical Colleges. Uh, she also had a bridal shop business on the side where she would donate bridal gowns to brides either in the military or ma marrying uh, people in the military. <coughs> so my point from this is to again illustrate this tension, we're going to come back to this a couple of times, <coughs> between this <coughs> cheating aspect of our personalities and the more moral, altruistic <coughs> aspect of our personalities. 
So just to give you uh, an idea of what I'd like to cover today, I'm going to focus on why people cheat, not just how. It's complex, not easy, so I'm going to have to distill it into a way that's, that fits into the, the time we have allotted today. I'm going to emphasize the psychology and neuroscience of cheating. Uh, I'm particularly interested in one aspect of the psychology that I'd like to share with you. And importantly, to raise some consciousness about cheating, how to use some of these ideas to prevent our personal cheating and to manage cheating in our role as leaders. After all, this is what, what this meeting is supposed to be about. So. Uh, I'm going to shorten this a little bit to give us more time for conversation, but any moral code, religion, group, society, has interdictions against cheating. But they're usually pretty arbitrary. Thou shalt not fill in the blank. God doesn't want us to cheat. But it really doesn't get to what cheating is really all about. The psychologists, going back to uh, Freud, <coughs> began to try to examine this, and they came up with the idea of the superego. So we have an id, this is Freud, we have an id that sort of ungoverned emotions, doing whatever we want, taking advantage, not taking into account any, anybody else. This tendency exists and is checked by another part of the brain called the ego, or specifically the superego, and this keeps us uh, somehow from lying, cheating, stealing all the time. Now, it really didn't go very far, and I'm going to offer possibility that Freud had his own issues with uh, cheating. He had an affair, uh, it seems, with his sister-in-law, and the history of uh, psychology and psychoanalysis is rife with people who had affairs with their patients, uh, teachers, uh, and colleagues. Texture has come to this, but it basically is the same thing. And, and this is really for another talk to go into the details of the psychological theories of cheating. Basically, what I want to leave you with is just this balance between unrestrained activity behavior and feelings, and the check <coughs> to try to be more considerate of others, altruistic, moral, if you will. The other social science that focuses on cheating are our are, are friends in uh, economics, okay? And I don't have time to go into all the uh, basis for the simple model of rational crime, but economists think that the reason people cheat is that they do a calculation. What are the chances I will get caught? What, will the, what are the chances I will lose money or lose reputation, run whatever risks I have, versus the gain that I can get from cheating? Uh, it turns out that this model doesn't work. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, what the gain is when I count my chips, uh, six instead of five. So I read this book. I recommend it to you very highly. It's The Honest Truth of, uh, About Dishonesty by Dan Ariely. And truly, we could spend the entire morning uh, with examples from, from the book. But I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points. So the basic uh, experimental protocol that he uses is he puts people in positions where they can cheat. Uh, there will be a t he'll administer a test, pretty difficult math or, or esoteric problems. The average score on one of these tests is something like four or five. And when he gives people the test, either in a booklet or in a computer program, that actually has the answer key in the test materials, people score six. Now, it's interesting, people don't score ten by the way. People, people cheat a little bit, and that's one of the theses that, that he advances. And there are multiple permutations of this example. Uh, 
I'm just going to talk about one, which I, which I think is fascinating and pertains to our thesis. So he gives people the test. They get, let's say, six or seven. And he brings them back for another test. And this time, the reward for the test is not the number of answers they get right. I think they get a, these are graduate students. They get a dollar for every right answer. So again, not huge sums of money. And the goal of the test in order to maximize their, he's an economist, maximize their reward is how close they can be to their prediction on the test. So he asked them, well, you're going to take the test. How many will you get right? And then they take the test, but guess what? There's no answer key. So the question is, how will they predict their performance? Will they predict their performance based on this knowledge that their inflated performance was as a result of cheating? Or will they say, well, really, I, I really only know 4 out of 10 or 5 out of 10. That's my uh, innate ability. What's the answer? Higher one. Higher. Once you've inflated yourself using cheating, it becomes part of your persona. Now, Jack already stole my thunder, as he always does in <laughs> golf. And uh, Dan Ariely says a funny thing. He says, they're called lies for a reason, you know, bad <laughs> lies. And uh, he does something interesting. Uh, first of all, he asks people not how, what they would do uh, in terms of scoring themselves, but what do you think other people would do in this situation? So he's able to elicit uh, with more freedom the idea that people actually cheat. And you know, I play golf with, with very upstanding people. I think of myself as an upstanding person. But there's usually very little similarity between the number of strokes that people take and the score that they're marking down on that sheet, especially when they're playing with my friend, Mr. Mulligan. <laughs> and he, the one example he gives is uh, he, he gives people a bad lie, an, a, basically almost an unplayable lie, and they have access to move the ball possibly either with the golf club, the foot wedge, how many of you people have foot wedges? I have a foot wedge in my bag. Or uh, picking the ball up and, and moving it to a, an improved line. People are much more likely to hit the ball with the golf club than they are to actually pick up the ball and move it. That's too cheating. <laughs> that interferes with our tension of trying to maintain ourselves as upstanding individuals even while we are we are cheating. Uh, again, the lawyers aren't here so we can talk freely. How many people, oh, one, oh there is a lawyer, one lawyer, but he's one of us. Um, how, many, how many people have never cheated on a form? Never cheated, form, any form, tax form? No, nobody has ever fudged an expense account or figured, well, uh, you know, I, I paid for that out of my pocket. Uh, who should get the miles, et cetera, et cetera. Remember, this is being videotaped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the fact is that uh, he has multiple evidence, and, and we know that this is the case. And uh, the IRS knows that this is the case, by the way. And he has a very interesting section on uh, fashion and knockoffs. Uh, how many people have ever bought a Louis Vuitton purse? So it, it's kind of inherent in the fabric of our um, society. And not even that, uh, I don't like the term hardwired, but it, there is strong evidence that uh, both the tendency to cheat as well as the moral counterweight to cheating uh, is there in infancy. And that child, children by the age of one year or even uh, less will fake crying. Uh, the classic example of the two-year-old who uh, comes up to the parent and says, my diaper's not poopy. 
This is two-year-olds. And as you go up uh, in, in our advanced development, uh, five-year-olds will lie outright to protect themselves. And uh, I'm not even going to get to adolescence, where this is really uh, a very key, very key issue. But at the same time, I do want to emphasize that there is a countervailing force, that even in nursery school, when kids don't play by the rules, the group will evict the kids who are not playing by the rules. And indeed, the, the neuroscience may not be the right word. I, I would prefer the biology because I, I talked to three very accomplished neuroscientists. I'm waiting for a response from a fourth. Uh, tell me, what are the neural pathways of cheating? And they all went, um, oh, very interesting. This is not in my area of expertise. We, we don't precisely know. I will say, I'll get ahead of myself a second, that I think it is a little bit like stupidity. It's something going on, a tendency. It may be driven by the dopamine pathway, the pathway for curiosity, the pathways for, as you'll see in a second, imagination and pretending that are being controlled or not by the higher pathways. That's the best I can do. And there, there are centers in the brain for morality, how that exactly mediates cheating and how the pathways work, exam for example, we do not know. So this oh. might be a subset of a larger pathway? Right. I mean, there, there are basic modules that we have for doing everything and how they fit in to a certain um, set of circumstances or, or environmental cues is really what the brain research project is about. But I, I don't think we're there yet. I can say my favorite quote. Uh, the neuroscientists say we know about neuroscience like Galileo knew about physics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these, um, these topics. So the evolutionary biologists um, have a problem because it's advantageous to cheat. And there are numerous examples in very low organisms, I think even in yeast, is this cheating or not? I don't know. Is it metaphor or not? I don't know. But there clearly is a evolutionary mechanism where people or organisms might take advantage in order to propagate their, their genes, in order to have survival of the fittest, if you will. I'm not going to summarize all the research on every lower organism, but certainly by the time you get to uh, mammals and certainly primates, you can detect this experimentally or anthro um, um, behaviorally. Female baboons mate with the non-alpha male surreptitiously. Chimpanzees will trick other members of the troop. This has led the evolutionary biologists to come to the conclusion, similar to the creativity piece I mentioned, is that the larger the neocortex, the more individuals in a society use dishonest tactics for social manipulation. And I'm using that term all the time now. I'm not cheating anymore. I'm using dishonest tactics for social manipulation. And the tragedy of the commons is, uh, this, you can see this in, in grazing, you can see in a lot of different situation is, that when you have common resources, if someone <laughs> takes advantage of the common resources, it's an advantage. It might be considered cheating. At the same time, particularly in a group, this behavior is risky. It can lead to opprobrium. It can lead to punishment. It can lead to excommunication from the group, and it could also lead to your being killed. So I think there's good evidence, both developmentally and from the evolutionary biology stand for, standpoint, that cheating and cooperation exist in a tension. That's really the bottom line message. And managing this tension 
is what, what leadership or what our challenges personally and, and in our companies and in our societies we have to address. Again, my chip example, this is a very big area of evolutionary biology. There's this guy named Trivers, who is a bit of a nutcase, but uh, he's fostered the idea that we actually deceive ourselves. And we know that there are examples of self-deception. He comes up with the idea that we deceive ourselves, count chips six for five, in order to practice cheating. And that if we can fool ourselves, we are better able to fool others. So there is a definite evolutionary tendency to cheat. And uh, the poets uh, get to this too. It's not a lie if you believe it. So there is some controversy about uh, whether males or females are more likely to cheat. Uh, the best that I can tell you is no. In academics, men cheat more than women, even accounting for the different um, more men in the higher levels of academia in the United States today. But <laughs> cheating is an equal opportunity employer. And like I said, uh, there is evidence that the more creative you are, the more likely you might be to cheat. Uh, certainly experimentally, and I would offer possibly even in, in everyday life. Why is this? Anybody have a, a shot? Okay. Why would creative people cheat more? Thank you. They're outside of the box thinkers. Right. They're outside of the box thinkers. It's creative. It's a challenge. It's creative. It's a challenge. It's exciting. And, and basically what I think you're saying, and, and my thoughts on this are that Something about cheating pertains to our ability to pretend, even as little kids. We're pretending, we're imagining. Um, my colleagues call this hallucinating. And actually, this is the way, by the way, we see the environment, this model that we look at the cup and we examine it for the color and how far it is, really is not the way our minds work. Uh, we actually hallucinate the cup first and then bring the cup into our experience. So I do think that this tendency to have uh, pretend, uh, out-of-the-box thinking, coupled with the excitement of being creative, again, it's that dopamine pathway, might be one of the considerations of cheating in general and the uh, increased cheating in creative people. I think a great example of that is a, a baseball pitcher that doctors the ball. Back in the day when Taylor Perry supposedly was doctoring the ball every time, he had the other team convinced that they would complain the whole game when, in fact, I'm sure about half the time he wasn't even shooting. He created that fantasy that it was happening every time. Very creative. I'm an admirer of Gaylord Perry. Uh, why do people cheat? What's the motivation for cheating? The, uh, the neuroscientists are not really the neuroscientists, I would say the neuropsychologists do point to the idea that people cheat is because they're afraid of loss. They're worried. They're anxious in, in our current ter terminology. And I'll have more to say about this. It turns out, yes? Might another motivation be thinking everybody else is doing it? And if you, if you don't do it, you're put, as was mentioned about Lance Armstrong, if you don't do it, you're falling behind, so Ab you're entitled to do it because they're all doing it. Absolutely, and, and wonderful entree to, to where we're going. Um, there are some funny things about cheating. Uh, the, if you put a person in a cheating uh, test or a lying test, their performance uh, of the, the amount of cheating they will do depends on the size of the chair they sit in and the desk. So if you put people in a big desk, they cheat more, or a big chair. If you put them in a smaller desk, they cheat less. There's also evidence that people cheat more in the afternoon than in the morning. You do the same test with, with the graduate students, and you give them the test uh, 
you know, first thing or, or at five o'clock, the cheating indices, whatever they are, uh, go up in the afternoon. Why is that? Laurie, yes? Okay. You're tired. You're tired. I've, I've just been reading about the fact that there's a theory that people have a certain amount of willpower, and you use it up. Correct. And so by the end of the day, your willpower battery is down, and so why not? That, that, that's the current hypothesis for that. Jack? When you get into the doldrums in the afternoon, you want something exciting. <laughs> right. All of, all of the above. So I think that we, I think we've honed in on some of the considerations of, of why people cheat. Uh, also, uh, everyone's doing it, right? Uh, there is a contagion to uh, cheating. Uh, a wonderful, uh, I think there's a video of this actually. Ariely sets up a buffet at a resort. And beautiful buffet with shrimp <coughs> and all sorts of wonderful foods, and very enticing. And it's roped off with uh, you know, little ropes and a big sign. This buffet for members of the Leadership Breakfast of Maryland only, underscored. And the hotel guests or the resort guests are standing around watching, watching, watching. And at some point, uh, sometimes it's with a confederate or sometimes it just uh, happens, uh, one person takes a shrimp. Well, guess what? The hordes immediately <laughs> descend upon uh, the buffet. So the, the interviewers say, well, didn't you see the sign? It says leadership breakfast only. And the rationalizations are just fantastic. They're, uh, oh, I'm on a meal plan and all my, all my uh, meals are included in my rate. Or, oh, there was so much food, it's just going to go to waste <laughs> anyway. So there is this tendency to cheat. You can do the same thing on tests, either, again, either with a confederate or uh, just wait for one person to cheat. As soon as the confederate starts <laughs> cheating, boom, uh, everyone will, will cheat. Steve? Bobberg says, uh, when we rationalize, we tell ourselves <coughs> rational lies. Yeah. <clears throat> it's well known in the buffet world, where you're not supposed to take anything home, that people of age tend to line their pockets with plastic and take it in their sure. pockets and then Sure, sure. Um, I, I remember my uh, uncle and his significant other, we, we would eat lunch at the, um, the Sloan Kettering Memorial uh, Dining Room, which was a very nice dining room. And I was shocked <laughs> by the amount of food that she was able to pack into her purse. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, wasn't that big, but... So, the, the point I want to make is that our self-image is extremely important to us in terms of both our cheating and not cheating. And this self-image comes from uh, this tension that I've underscored so far. We really need to feel good about ourselves, but at the same time, there is a instinct, drive, some sort of tendency uh, to try to gain advantage over others. And just segueing a little bit into the management of this, uh, the honor codes, the moral codes, exist to help us with this. There's some fascinating literature, I don't have time to go over it, on how babies at six months, maybe even earlier, uh, have a moral code already. But by the way, that bespeaks the fact that if you, you have a moral code, you have to have a moral code uh, for something. Maybe we can talk about that sometimes. Um, Ariely found that if you give people a form and they can cheat on it, if you sign the form at the top, I have not cheated on this test or on this uh, examination or program, you're 
less likely to have cheating than if you sign the form at the bottom. So he goes to the IRS, he, he's a big professor, and he says, look, I have these findings that you know, people shouldn't be signing the 1040 form at the end or at the bottom. They should sign it at the top. And they said, no, we're not doing that. We're not, <laughs> we're not changing is, is, is that. Is there any understanding of what, why that makes a difference? It, it's somehow having in mind the, the neat, what, when you're doing it, having in mind the, the interdictions against cheating and the risks of cheating is more effective than after the fact. And Ariely says that in his class, at the beginning of every class or every quarter or throughout the class, he tells his students, cheating will not be condoned in this uh, class. Now, I used this example in my previous talk here, I think it's fascinating, the, the Ten Commandments. So you put people in a cheating situation, you uh, ask them to list the Ten Commandments. Now, most people can't list the Ten Commandments. Most people can barely list two of the Ten Commandments. But irrespective of whether the, the number or whether they can remember any of the Ten Commandments, cheating goes down significantly just by kind of a reference to a moral code. A similar study is done in children where they are given the opportunity to lie. And one group of kids is told the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. And the other group is told the story of the big bad wolf. The children who are taught the story of the uh, George Washington lie less. So it's a very, very potent consideration to have these honor codes. So what I'd like to do is try to tie this together from uh, a psychological study that I read about children who cheat. There, there are groups of kids, usually uh, tweens, preteens, who get into trouble in school with a lot of things, that, including constant cheating in, uh, in the classroom. So they come to the therapist, and the therapist has to help them stop cheating. Now, traditionally, people would use the same techniques. Oh, it's not a good idea, tell me about this, tell me about that. That doesn't work. The technique that works is that the therapist starts cheating with them. You know, there, there's play, they, they're playing a game. And this is really welcomed by the, the young kid. And he likes the idea that he has someone who's also cheating. But when the therapist starts winning, it's not okay anymore. And it opens up a discussion, even with a young child, of what it means for them to cheat. So I'm going to summarize a, a great deal of work with the idea that cheating involves magical thinking. The idea that we can make things right just by thinking about it. Cinderella a little bit. This is very typical of young children. It's kind of omniscient and uh, omnipotent. This is an attention between what we, we, we saw before as fear or anxiety, that failure can be extremely humiliating. And in order to avoid failure, people will go, children and us, I think, will go to extreme lengths in order to avoid failure, particularly when it's associated with feelings of devastation and humiliation. That when we cheat, it's a manifestation of an inability to transition from this magical thinking where all we have to do is count the chips and they won't affect our, our um, caloric intake, or that, um, you know, those bastards at Whole Foods, their prices are really terrible. I could get the same thing at Trader Joe's for 30% less. And this is the way we balance some of the offenses that we feel in a very magical way. It's purely magical.
So here, here we are. We're going to talk a little bit about how to prevent cheating based on what we've learned so far. We're good. Um, any questions to this point? Or I haven't heard too many examples of, of you guys cheating. Is it the camera? That's, uh, <laughs> the camera is on us all the time, by the way. That's right. right? I think you're right. It's all about, not just with young kids, but it's all about failure. If there's you know, it's something you miss at work, and then depending on your relationship with your boss, and they say, did you call so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I called him and haven't gotten back to me. I mean, that's a familiar right. lie right. to you know, show that you're not failing at what you're doing. I mean, that's just a small example. Yeah, pa Pamela Myers gives that example too. It's a very good TED talk. I would I would uh, encourage you to watch it. Uh, I took some ideas uh, from from her. I want to acknowledge her. Not acknowledging other people that that's real cheating. But I took some ideas uh, from her. It's really very excellent. Just, uh, from your comment a moment ago about the, the getting told the cherry tree story in Washington and then signing the IRS document on top of the page before you. It sounds to me there's maybe a pattern of, uh, of whether if, if, we're, if we're disconnected with the concept or the idea of cheating, the prospect of cheating, that if, we're not, if it doesn't appear on our radar screen, we'll be more inclined to cheat. So if you can find ways to bring it up consciously right. before you go and make your choice, whether it's a self-affirmation or what, is there something to that? Yes, I think uh, this talk is a kind of consciousness yeah. raising activity. And I think it's the discussion that has to happen in many organizations, which doesn't necessarily happen. Um, I, I was involved recently in a co contractor controversy on some work uh, at, at in the kitchen in my condo. And uh, you know, I missed the boat. I wish that I had said to the contractor the first time I met him, now you're not going to cheat me, are you? And I think it's a very potent technique uh, to use to raise the consciousness of cheating. Now, again, there's no guarantee, but uh, having that, that code is very important. Yes? I think that brings up a very good point. I'm, I'm a Rotarian, and in the Rotary, they have a four-way test. And as we were going through this whole presentation, I've been thinking about the four-way test. And I think it's uh, one of those things that just brings it to the top of mind throughout your life. Thanks. <coughs> Jack? Seems to me that, uh, or what's coming up for me anyway, signing it at the top. Uh, I haven't gotten into the form, I haven't gotten into the practicalities, but my mores say, no, I'm not going to cheat. So I do that. As I get down in there and I have to make decisions one way or the other, uh, and particularly as I get into the, to the bigger number for the tax <laughs> versus the bigger number for what I could keep, uh, I tend to lean one way. I'm not going to tell you which way. <laughs> Great. But the practical of, uh, of, of making the choices is, is where it gets uh, uh, different. Absolutely. So to go through the possibilities, is an important thing is to support the self-image of individuals in the workplace, at schools, that the goal is to really be upstanding folk, upstanding students, upstanding uh, employees. The establishment of an honor code, although there are failures, uh, actually work. Um, those those uh, universities that have honor codes, cheating seems to be less than at universities that oh, don't. Which kind of honor code? There, there are honor yeah. codes which are, I didn't cheat, and there are honor codes which are, I promise to snitch on my colleagues if they cheat. Right. Those are two different things. Right. Um, again, I, I can't go, I don't know. I, I can't go into the details of that. But, um, Again, it, it brings up the issue is, you know, what is snitching, right? The, the people uh, who worked for the FBI in Abscam were snitching, and they were con people, NSA. Uh, again, there is, it's not, it, there are moral issues and, and ethical issues involved in, in uh, honor and code. But I think it comes from this tension between wanting to gain advantage. I mean, do I snitch on my buddy because, well, it's going to get rid of one, one other potential medical school applicant, or am I upholding uh, a virtuous uh, stance? Um, ethics training is the usual knee-jerk response to a cheating violation organization. 
I think there's very little evidence that ethics training actually works. Uh, again, it's, it's useful and it raises consciousness, but actually I think more important is focus on some of the things that we discuss here. And taking these minor transgressions seriously is actually very important. And uh, again, it's not easy, but um, you know, we're all cheating a little bit. I think it's worthwhile tracking it and having penalties that are appropriate. I mean, doctors, by the way, who, who make mistakes, uh, the, the grand way to um, uh, keep people from admitting that they're making mistakes is to have very severe penalties for uh, uh, a malpractice or... or Regarding that, uh, the FAA, I think, has risk-free self-reporting. If pilots make mistakes, they're encouraged to report them Excellent. without risk for the data and to, to learn from what went wrong and try to, uh, try to avoid it recurring, but not shoot the pilot for making a mistake. Bob? Um, to your third bullet, um, as more and more turmoil comes into the uh, commercial world, it, it saps anybody's sense of security, and you would be amazed or appalled, might be a better term, at some of the behaviors that erupt out of that, uh, out of those organizational and individual defenses. Right, they they are defenses. Yes. Well, probably over the last ten years, you've seen uh, an influx of these whistleblower um, rules put into place, or you could report to somebody at the board anonymously, etc. Is there any any findings as to if this is uh, curtailing? Cheating at a corporate level or not? Um, not expert there. I think our human resources, my, my guess is yes. I, I think when you promote an, an environment where you can whistle blow, um, keeps, keeps things in check a little bit. Now, not necessarily immune from abuse. So to try to summarize it all in one sentence, uh, this is again from the psychotherapy article. It's a kind of a goal. I'd rather play the regular way, by the rules, even if I might lose, because if I win, I know I won for real. And I think that's the standard. That goes back to golf. Yeah. So uh, I could go through. I'm done. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm a participant right now. Okay. Um, it seems to me that, that cheating is, is situational and environmental. And what I mean by that, I'll use an example. When I took up golf, uh, I played with a, with a very tolerant person um, who managed to, with my 200 strokes for the, nine, the front nine, um, what he said is when you land in the, in the rough, then take the ball and put it up on a little tuft of grass because it'll be much easier to hit. So as far as I was concerned, that was part of the rules of the game. Sure. As I learned about the rules of the game, then I developed a cheating thing of still doing that even though I know that you're not supposed to. Right. I think that you're addressing the issue that, um, A, it's complicated, and, two, that it is situational. Again, the white lie, we, you know, it's appropriate. Uh, similarly, some sort of grand uh, cheating like a spy apparatus in the time of war. Uh, I think that's okay. Another example is, is my mother, uh, before I was a driver, uh, she would say, if you're going home late at night and the, uh, the, you've got a traffic light and there's nobody in sight, that even though the light's red, you can go through it. I got two tickets before I realized that, that wasn't <laughs> right. the thing. That's, that's the enforcement of the moral code. So uh, it's ubiquitous. Uh, we need to understand it better. There are theories that underlie approaches to um, managing cheating. Uh, they are psychological and economic. I do think that these these principles, I, I, I think this might be new to you, but I think they're very important. This grandiosity, this wishful thinking, this tendency to overcome all the wrongs that we experience by fighting fire with fire is a component of cheating. And our worries 
about failing or being seen as inept might encourage cheating. So managing that tension is really what, uh, what it's all about. So the way to do it is to establish codes of behavior, to try to be fair, avoid harsh punitive me measures, keep people's uh, uh, self-image up, uh, just like uh, the Ten Commandments. I mean, moral codes from uh, religious organizations or uh, organizational structure are very important. But we still have a lot to learn. And I think we need to understand the developmental biology and the evolutionary biology uh, well, we don't know what the pathways are, and I'm not sure we know whether small cheating leads to big cheating. Maybe, you know, small cheating can immunize you against big cheating. And we need to measure the impact of any um, measures that we take to manage cheating to make sure that they, in fact, work on all these levels. And I've tried to take us from my personal uh, to the um, organizational and to its societal scale. So I have a bibliography. Feel free to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, we can talk privately. And thank you for your attention.